Hello, everybody, and even if you don't have a body. I'm Lehman Pascal, and this is another installment of the Integral Stages author series. Today, we're joined by Jahan Hamsezadeh. Jahan! To discuss Hello? his book, The Psilocybin Connection. And uh, you folks watching or listening to this probably know that psychedelic compounds, particularly those that occur naturally in plants, have a long history of use in human religion, therapy, neurological adaptation to new circumstances, and the deep art of culture building. And although they have frequently faced suppression and disparagement from control-oriented social authorities seeking to reinforce particular states of mind or demonize certain particular population segments, they've never gone away, and they remain a topic of enduring experimentation, curiosity, and promise for many. So I figure it's high time for an integrative multi-dimensional look at the scientific and philosophical and practical leading edge of understanding about what these are, what they do to us, what they do with us, and how we can have a maximally sane and productive social and personal relationship with them. Hi, John. Hello. Hello. Such an honor. First thing, where can people get their hands on this fantastic book? Thanks. It's uh, coming out this next week, April 5th. It's a distributor at Penguin Random House, so it'll be across all major platforms including Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Targets. So just go ahead and search up uh, the psilocybin connection. Uh, The subtitle is Psychedelics, the Transformation of Consciousness and Evolution of the Planet, an Integral Approach. Fantastic. Second of all, what is so great about the band Tool? Thank you. Yeah, favorite band for 20 years and definitely helped wake me up uh, pretty early on as a teen. I felt they intertwined a lot of mysticism, a lot of uh, Jungian thought into their lyrics. Um, and many times it felt like they were talking about from their direct psychedelic experiences and even embedded uh, sounds of um, Timothy Leary and Bill Hicks into their music. And so I ended up taking some mushrooms at their concert when I was 18 and had a very transformative experience that kind of set the trajectory for the rest of my life. And I feel they've really pushed the edges artistically, intellectually, um, and even musically, like with the standard of music. A lot of their songs are like eight to 10 minutes long. So they've really pushed the boundaries of their artistic form. Nice. One of the things that jumped out at me in the early sections of the book was a story about your first psychedelic experience and that afterwards you experienced this deep wave of anger at the world, the society, Mm -hmm. the systems that had ignored or deliberately withheld these beautiful transformative experiences from people. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, when you look back now, do you see that anger as, as a mistake, as an unnecessary reaction of immaturity, or do you think it played an essential role? Do you think the situation Mm -hmm. and the future path of your life needed the fire of that anger? I I love you highlighting that. Um, Yeah, I would say immaturity in the sense that I was naive and that's all I knew at the time. Um, My life before the experience had been very, very painful. And of course, pain is a deep part of life and and follows afterwards. But before that, it was almost as if I was in a dark tunnel and I didn't know there was another side of this tunnel. So life just seems like this big, dark journey that was just full of pain and agony and those depressed, atheistic, suicidal um, my parents were both, you know, immigrants. They had a hard kind of poverty life growing up. And I didn't get, say, the love and support I needed to kind of develop in a very healthy way, including a lot of self-esteem. And this experience really broke me through to see that a foundation of, of our existence is love, that we're deeply interconnected. And I'll use the word God, but like a deep intelligence unites all of us. And that this world could be, in fact, heaven. And in many ways, it would be. Everything is available here. It's just kind of how we perceive it and treat it and one another instead of kind of like this disconnected all versus all kind of realm. And so I felt this was almost like hell and like constantly in this existential agony of like, why do I exist? Why am I here? This is all painful. And after the moment of kind of breaking through and kind of seeing that there's this fundamental existence that we're all a part of, you know, what came up for me was, why was I so lied to? If this is the truth, why was I constantly getting this message that we're in hell? And it occurred to me, the only thing I was saying was that nobody else knew. You know, and of course, people know, but nobody in my environment in Tucson, Arizona, growing up in that culture knew that. And so there was a sense of betrayal in the sense that I I felt so much pain coming at me, but they also didn't know. So that was a response coming from having been in this tunnel. That being said, you know, during that journey, I saw almost every like frame of my life flashed before me very fast within moments and saw that everything was almost perfectly choreographed to get me to this breakthrough, that the pain was almost this rocket fuel for me to break orbits and and into this space. And so the pain was absolutely needed. Um, I would say, you know, a lot of times I reference psychedelics as the most transformative experiences in my life, but it's been the pain for better or worse. It's been the fuel that's pushed me to grow in many ways. 
you went through a number of educational phases of devotion to psychology, to physics, to math, to neuroscience. What would you say all those things had in common? Yeah, 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 you know, a lot of it stems from that one experience uh, in this place. I'd say God, but you can say a unitive networked intelligence or whatever people want to describe it. You know, this kind of uh, entity. To it. Um, it said that love is the most important thing in life by far. And then miles after that is learning. And everything else is so insignificant compared to these kind of two values orientations to reality that you'll never have to worry about anything else. And so, you know, very much then approach life with a very much open heart, but then when love, more deep and sense of intimate love wasn't available, I focused on learning. And it became ravenous and really filled me. And, you know, I think it kind of fills you with joy in many ways. Learning in many ways is also becoming more intimate or closer with the universe, whether you're learning about the biological sciences or if you're learning with your, like, you, if you have a lover and you're really interested, you want to know everything about them, it's a way to get closer to, to, to reality. So psychology became a, a deep interest just because I wanted to understand myself and people because I I think we're the most fascinating parts of this existence, the most complex parts of it, and it's a way to really touch the interiority of the universe. Um, but also spent like three years in mathematics and physics because I wanted to understand like the whole structure. So at the end of the day, I believe we're all one being, right? And we're all one system, you know, at the end of the same, it's also one, one large, almost metaphorically organism. So whatever I'm deciding to learn, I was learning more about the whole. Yeah. When I saw that or read that list uh, in your book, I immediately thought alchemist. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> right, because nice this is, it's exactly the kind of set of disciplines I would expect from a, a Renaissance magus of some kind, you know? Seems mm. very natural, very old school to be to have that uh, mutual set of interacting interests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely has been quite a pull. And for those people that haven't read the bio, you know, did went to neuroscience first and then, then math and physics and then transferred after a mushroom trip home into leaf physics that it's not going to quite get to the core of what I'm wanting to know. Instead of studying mysticism, and my response was like, that's not even a major. There's no social security or even job offering for, for mysticism. So I ended up majoring in philosophy, minoring in psychology, physics, class away from math. I came to the Bay Area, got the master's in uh, consciousness and transformative studies, and then the doctors of philosophy, cosmology, consciousness that kind of encompassed a lot of what I want to learn. And during that time working on the dissertation, which was uh, psychedelics, including an integral approach, I uh, had a mushroom journey and it said to go into three more trainings. And I was like, wow, I'm already at the end of this road of almost a 20 year journey in higher education, but I, I've trusted them so far. And so I went into a uh, Mazatec mushroom tradition uh, to learn about how to hold space with mushrooms. And to go into that, I had to take a Komi, which is a two-year somatic psychotherapy training. I assisted for two years at the psychedelic certificate training at CIS. So it's been a, a very long road and very enriching, though. Very enriching. Yeah. There are a lot of different dimensions to how we could gain skill in handling these substances, right? Mm -hmm. There's what goes on with us inside. How do we socially handle them? The physical stuff of what actually happens when a tryptamine molecule goes into a human body. What would you say we understand about all that now that they didn't know in the 1960s? Um, I think you thank God that we've got feel we have them to build off of and we've come very far as a culture. A line that's always stood out has been from um, Michael Pollan in his book, um, How to Change Your, the Way You Think. And he says that the main thing that went wrong during the 60s compared to what we have now is that they didn't have a container at the time. Um, whether that be a container for the experience largely or also a cultural container of, in context of understanding. So, you know, in when the, the indigenous traditions, cultures have been using this for thousands of years, it's, it's largely passed down um, intergenerationally. So like the elders hold space for, you know, the, the younger people and the younger people eventually gain all their wisdom and hold space for the next generation. And here he says at what other point in human history did the young have a, such a searing rites of passage that the older generation didn't understand? You know, people are having these breakthrough paradigm shifting experiences and understandably that uh, caused fear in the older generation. So it quickly moved to becoming illegal. Now we have another generation to build off of. We have elders now. You know, we have a lot of scientific backing. We've integrated a lot of indigenous wisdom. I think we've matured as a culture dramatically. Thank you, partly to the experiences that the other generations had. You know, that they've influenced culture, the music, uh, movies, technologies. They've influenced philosophies, ways of thinking. So there's that. Oh, the 60s impacted every part of culture. And now we have more of a solid platform, you know, and, and, and a stable foundation to be growing out of. Uh, I love that you're highlighting the the regeneration of eldership in this area. Yeah. That seems really important and like it doesn't get discussed often enough. I think the other question that's that goes along with 
you know, what didn't they know in their day is what do we still not know? Like, what are the open mm-hmm. questions? What is the, what are the key outstanding questions about this stuff that you would love to have answered that you still don't know what the answer is? That, that is, I love that question. You know, a couple things come to mind. One saying, what is the core of the experience or insight? And I think, you know, depending of where we are with our journey with psychedelics, we, we, we would have different answers. And for me, though, the after maybe 400 different journeys and 20 years of working with these medicines, as a, the core experience is that of unity. You know, I, it's hard to think that there's something even deeper than that. And, and unity can look in so many different ways and flavors. It's infinite. Uh, you know, so it could just like how large the universe and how many levels of it, that's how many ways it can, it can express itself. So you need to be, can be like one with God or one with light or having this experience of embodying the entire planet or seeing the evolution of the cosmos, but really deeply understanding it in an energetic and physical and experiential way that this is all one large evolving system. And um, with that, I mean, the healing is dramatic. So much of our healing comes from a state of fragmentation, of loneliness, of not enoughness. If you feel you're a part of this larger body, it's almost as if you're a cell in a body, realizing you're part of a larger body. And in some ways, you are that larger body, even though you are the cell, this unique individual. It, it, it changes most of the things in life. It meets a lot of the base needs, even looking at like Maslow's hierarchy. But you feel safer in the world. You feel a greater sense of belonging, the security. You feel a greater sense of connection and love, um, a greater sense of self-esteem. There's more towards self Actualization and then self transcendence, like there's more beyond me and I can give to this larger body. So I think it meets it psychologically very well. So I think that's one of the main experiences. And as um, Richard Doyle points out in his book, um, Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and Evolution of the Noosphere, he read uh, thousands of trip reports for the book. And he says that the main psychedelic insight is realizing they're part of a vast interconnected living system and they should be returned ecodelics. You know, so to understand what it is at the core of these medicines. And for me, it's a question that really stuck with me so much is why do these medicines even exist? You know, like why are there even compounds that create such a high ordered experience and why do they evolve in the environment? And I think the answer to that is is an ecological one. You know, we've been a part of an ecological system for millions of years that's been co-evolving, you know, so including the plants, the fungi, everything around it. And so that they evolved here for evolutionary reasons. Okay, well, I want to come back to the biospheric element, but let's touch in on the evolutionary thing because... Uh, two, my, my favorite minor theories of evolution are the aquatic ape theory, which says that we must have evolved in rivers and oceans and frequent immersion in water. And the other one is the classic Terence McKenna stoned ape theory, right? Speculating mm-hmm. that entheogenic fungi were available to our ancestors, that it fits their behavioral pattern to consume them, and that it confers certain Darwinian advantages in terms of visual acuity and coordination for micro dosing, increased reproductive likelihood at larger doses, and beyond that, a whole symphony of inspirational self knowledge and neural reorganization that would really help developing art, language, religion, and culture. What would you say is the current status of that hypothesis? Is it just fancifully plausible or is there any real evidence that would incline us to treat it as serious history? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, responses to that is several years ago, I really kind of came to this core that I think it's the best theory and almost the best idea I've ever come across. And I think that's a very large statement. And before I made that, I did a year on um, my comparative, comprehensive exam, just focused solely in a very academic context of what are the major ideas that we've come through in Western history in the last 2000 years. And for me, that one idea really set out above the rest because its implications are so huge that we can finally understand how we came here as a human species. Um, and it very much, I think, is grounded in anthropology and chemistry, you know, in ecological grounding. And, and I'll get into the, the details. But it also leads us back home. You know, like I see it it, it's a part of our history and it grew our, you know, our brain very much now in the last 10 years that we know it stimulates neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons, the brain physically begins to grow. But going back to what made us human, we can even become more human, you know, and given that it creates ecological awareness, uh, stimulates empathy and, and expands our sense of creativity, I think it can be the catalyst that can help us solve major of the world problems. And, you know, as uh, Fritjof Capra points out, you know, a big systemic thinker, including um, writing the books like The Hidden Connection and Systems of View of Life, he says that the main crisis that we're facing as a species is a problem of perception. And, and that's the main kind of systemic issues. You know, it's the way that we're looking at the world and how we're interacting with it. And this kind of really cleanses the, you can say, the doors of perception in many ways. And so the status of that. So internally, it's obviously, it's, it's the most legit one I've ever come across after 20 years of academia of looking at, at, at it. And so I really wanted to create context for it. It's, it's the heart of the book, that theory. 
And I break down over many, many chapters, laying out all the evidence, you know, grounded in a lot of other academic thoughts and a lot of scientific research that I think it's the most rational explanation for our development. And in terms of culturally how it's looked at, it's definitely going through a revival. You know, major thinkers uh, like Paul Stamets has really been putting it out there. And he's a very, you know, probably the world's best known mycologist, highly respected. He's been talking about it a lot. And, you know, he was able to put it in Michael Pollan's work. You know, Joe Rogan's putting it out. There are a lot of other thinkers that are influential in the culture right now are putting it back out there. But I wanted to posit it more as not even at this point, even a hypothesis, but as a theory. I several years ago went in and asked uh, Paul Stamets because he is talking about this in a, as a lecture at a festival. And he says, it's a hypothesis. And I went to him, I was like, well, what did it be a theory? He's like, well, we would need more evidence specifically in areas of creativity. That this boosted creativity in early humanity. And I camped with um, the MAPS camp at the last Burning Man Festival and saw him give a talk. And he says, we now have enough evidence to posit this as a theory. Um, because there's a lot of evidence, uh, including scientific clinical studies, that show it increases creativity. And it would have done so than our ancestors. And so it's, it's starting to frame about it, talk about this way. And yeah, I think we're pretty much there. But the down part is more people need to become aware of it. And as pe the stigma with psychedelics begins to move away, I think more people are going to be ready to accept it. That's the main building block. All the, all the rational reasons are there. It's just we'd have to come to terms that it was a substance and or you could see something in our diet that naturally grows all over the environment that actually stimulated our consciousness and helped it expand. You know, there's an emotional issue around how central people feel these things to be, right? Some people emotionally are rejecting them. Some people are feeling, well, look, that's an option, right? It's maybe part of the story about how we become creative and build cultures. And other people are feeling like this is the central mechanism by which this occurred. And it's an important question because I think we're looking yeah. at a situation where we need to be uh, co-evoking and regenerating new culture that's up to date right now. It's a huge mm -hmm. challenge we're facing. Mm -hmm. So in terms of handling that emergency condition, let's say, how central are these things? Are they one of many interesting options or are they right at the core of the enterprise? Yeah, you know, and uh, as you mentioned, I think a lot of us are going to look at it different ways. And I think a part of the reason is, well, what has a relationship with them so far? Somebody that's never tried them, it's going to be very difficult for them to posit them at, at the central uh, part or at the heart of this kind of evolutionary story. Uh, somebody that's barely tried them but never had even breakthrough experiences or people that have even had hard, bad experiences because the right set and setting wasn't there are going to have a hard time pausing that as a central part of the theory. But those of us that have used them very well, that knows how much they can give us in their lives and have done a good amount of studying, it becomes pretty clear. You know, um, this is it in my own life. You know, I've spent so many years in different transformative, you know, containers, you know, so many workshops, lots of therapy, a lot of community work, relationships and meditation. And it's, it's clear in my life that the most transformative experiences have been those on psychedelics. That being said, it's, you can have the breakthrough experiences and then you have to embody them, right? There's all the talk of integration and so on, but it's just like putting them into practice and it's synergistic with all the other practices, right? It's, it's it encouraged me to meditate more. It's encouraged me to be better in relationships. It's to show up in community. So they, they create the catalytic experience in many ways and the kind of downloads and teachings. And yet at the heart of this whole story, I would say some, something more like love, right? Like they're here to express and help us realize that we're all deeply interconnected. So what I learned in mushrooms at the point of existence is love, right? So that would be more at the heart, but this is a mechanism to help us really discover, you know, that truth. I've, I've worked with so many people as I do these uh, journeys legally in Jamaica, where they're like, I, you know, and it, it's sad to hear sometimes that, like people in their 50s and 60s, are like I've never experienced love before like this. Like I've said the word, I didn't know what it meant. And they come back home to their partners, their wives or children's, and they change radically sometimes with one experience and become much better connected people. You know, so for those of us that have a transformative journey, it does become at the heart of that. And I think that's available to almost everybody. It, it takes a lot of do your homework, you know, be in the right setting and setting. But for most of us, there's a small people it doesn't, uh, it's not active for, but for most of us, it, it can really wake something up inside. That idea of shifting from using the word love to really feeling like you understand what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, that's at the heart of all of our educational conundrums, right? We can take in experiences, even fantastic experiences. We can take in knowledge, but what makes the difference between that and understanding? How do we assimilate? How do we integrate? What are, what's your summary uh, of what you think are the most effective core practices for assimilating and integrating uh, peak mm -hmm. experiences of these kinds? Yeah. 
I think what comes to mind is, is relationships really ground us and tether us. And so really showing up on the relationships, given that love's the most important thing, you know, it's going to be specifically the people, you know, the now also animals and a relationship to the biosphere and to the universe as a whole. And the people around us, specifically whether it's family members or, you know, partners or close community, it's like where we get the most feedback. Um, so as we're giving love and if they're very open and so on, they receive it and they can give it back. And it's kind of strengthens these bonds, you know, we're a deep network and those tethers become strengthened. And we get to anchor in more of this reality that's based, I think, of love. And when I say love, also what I learned is it's the most intelligent force in the universe. You know, there's so many ops, ops and you know, in every moment we're faced with so many options, it's for a lot of us, it's harder to see which option to make. And we tend to, what I see is that we have a compass inside that's always directing us, that's kind of the guided by this larger impulse of oneness. And as we tend to trust that and bring that into our relationships and our actions, it begins to strengthen within us, but then the world feels that and kind of mirrors that back. So relationships would be the most. Um, and then aside from that relationship with self, which is, you know, kind of having integrity, being very honest with ourselves, very open to, all our parts, whether it's heart, guts, and mind, kind of uh, moving towards a oneness within our being, but then also the sense of oneness with other people and the planet and you know, existence as a whole. Yeah. Ken Wilbur and others have called psychedelics um, non-specific amplifiers of experience, right? And there is a sense in which the effects are non-specific, very general, very flexible, right? Uh, set setting and dosage means that mindset and setting can take these trips in very different directions. Mm -hmm. And that allows people to use them to have modified versions of all kinds of different experiences, right? What's, what's it like to watch Star Wars on acid? What's it like to make love on mushrooms or go to a museum mm -hmm. or go swimming? But all of that non-specificity is also joined by this sense that particularly in the plant-based compounds, that there's a possibility of interacting with them as if they're independent agents or autonomous collective intelligences. So it seems like we can treat these experiences either as modifications of ourselves or as the presence of a communicative other. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's your experience been in this regard? And what do you see as the virtues of each approach? Should we be designing mm -hmm. trips or should we mm -hmm. be asking the mushroom what to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It definitely. I think, again, it, it involves what paradigm you bring to the substances because that'll kind of set the context of your understanding. And then I'll get into also the person's experience. So how well do they know the substance? Having said, there's such a wide variety of compounds and they're each so different. You know, for somebody that's very unexperienced with different substances in period, uh, they tend to look, everything is just drugs and put everything is the, that's together. And it's hard for them to distinguish, understandably, something between like cocaine, heroin, and psilocybin. Once you get into the psychedelics, the palette is huge, you know, there's like the trip that means that that kind of are like psilocybin, DMT, LSD, and so on, and the search on the base system. And there's like the phenethyl means like mescaline and MDMA. And then there's other compounds completely different, like say iboga and ketamine, right? They each produce, those are different families. And within those families, there's such unique nu nuances. So even within the trip, means, you know, like LSD and psilocybin. So LSD is derived from a type of fungus, um, ergot, you know, psilocybin itself directly from the mushrooms. And they're both beautiful compounds, but even then, the LSD lasts twice as long and is far more potent by weight. Um, but what I've seen with mushrooms is it's a lot more shadow work and a lot more kind of deep, integral, just healing. You know, people have worked a lot with mushrooms. They're like, I feel solid. You know, like I feel very honored in this life. And uh, I think his name was Horace Grace. He was a PhD student at CIS and he wrote his dissertation um, what he termed auditory hallucinations, meaning you heard voices on psychedelics and people heard more voices and contacts with entity on psilocybin compared to the other compounds. So more likely to get almost contact with intelligence. But what really what kind of stands out to me is the work by Stanislav Grof, you know, the great uh, transpersonal psychologist, worked in the field for about 60 years, about 50,000 case, you know, he worked about 50,000 people in holotropic states. And he says that these substances trigger what he calls holotropic states of consciousness, states of consciousness that organically move towards wholeness. So these are self-organizing states, or he would never look at them necessarily as like, you know, non-specific amplifiers. It's like you're part of a self-organizing system, just like your body is in a very real deep way. It's constantly moving blood and moving all the molecules around on its own. It's very organized. And that the planet does this as a whole, that this does this also to the brain. You know, we've said that partly also when we look at uh, MRI studies. So certain substances, can be nonspecific, you know, so that's what we have to see. It's just something like 
it's like ketamine or LSD are a little bit more like that direction, but they're, they're still part of a psyche that your mind is constantly self-organizing. It's not random completely. It's, it's somewhat self-organizing. And I think mushrooms have even a greater degree of that. And so provided the right set and setting, what, what I've seen is across the board, people come to the same insights. You know, we're part of this deeper structure of self-organization is, um, you know, something like Aldous Huxley points out that there's like a perennial philosophy. So whether you're interacting with consciousness across any kind of method, across all the disciplines, whether it's meditation, dancing, it's contemplation, we reach the same truths, you know, of interconnection and love. And it just happens, you know, what I see in, in, in that many, in many people, that that just route becomes a lot quicker on psychedelics. It doesn't necessarily, you don't need uh, years of dedication to practice to have that experiential reality. It's sometimes you just need four hours. You know, so I, I think, you know, just to get to your answer very much quick, I think there's a self-organization process in, in most of these compounds and a lot of us will reach the same truths provided a, a very safe container. So even though there's a lot of variation that's possible, there's a general trend that it's moving towards, particularly with some classes of substance. I think so. Okay. Well, I'm curious how you think about um, discovery or invention with these things. Like mm. uh, when you have an experience, let's say you a fungus goes into your body. <laughs> are mm. you are you downloading information or are you and the fungus inventing something that's never existed? Is this the revelation of what was hidden or the creation of something new? Yeah, no, I love that question. You know, to use the integral model of just holons, it's just, just really at what level you're looking at. At and for those the listeners that may not be aware, you know that that we kind of involve in this pattern of parts and holes. You know, from atoms coming together, from molecules, molecules coming together, from cells, and that higher level organisms. So just even looking at my body, it's at what level am I looking at it? Yes, I'm all atoms, almost all molecules, almost all cells. One being true doesn't make the other not true. And so, depending how we're looking at this plane of existence, so if I'm looking at this psychedelic experience just from the terms of my personal biology you know it's my brain highly interconnecting creating the state of unity inside that's correlated also with creativity right so in this case it's like my brain's unifying we see that with mri studies people can google up mri studies in psilocybin versus placebo and the hyper connection creates you know a lot of internal um insights and ideas it really even re rejuvenates the dendrites in the brain that had atrophy so a lot of hyperconnection right if i'm looking at an ecological landscape it can be seen like as a symbiotic relationship between us and fungus and fungi you know to put that bigger picture you know the mushrooms themselves is the fruit of a larger body it's the mycelium that interconnects all the plants and, and systems in the environment so it's a large living network that we've always been living on top of and so it's pretty much this large ecosystem that we're having these experiences with that's helping us kind of in a very symbiotic way create newness or novelty. If we're looking at it more like a non-dual kind of God approach, then it's a little bit more like downloads. So these two parts are part of a larger entity, you know, and it very much seems so that regardless with many psychedelics, you know, you arrive to the state of, of like, I'm one with the cosmos because that's our deep truth. And that includes I'm one with the ecosystem in a very deep way. So in this way, it's almost more like a download that we're connecting with like a larger networked you know central server that connects the entire universe together that's giving us the state of downloads and so in these states sometimes there's the experience of download in terms of it's almost closer to an albert albert in the north white head kind of way that um he has this idea of prehension that the whole universe connects through feeling spontaneously and at once it downloads and gives all the information at the whole all at once and it's very precognitive. It's you know, we unpack it and interpret it. But there's this exact feeling, and I've received the package of like, whoa, that was a lot. And sometimes it could take years to unpack that, and sometimes just moments. So then that experience is a download. But then also it, it, the synergistic effects, as I mentioned, in terms of, of the symbiosis between that, you know, the environment, but also that with other people that are having these experiences, right? So you can have two very creative minds <laughs> come together that can. Uh, bring things into the world that have never existed before you know as, as complexities increase within their own mind complexities increase between these two individuals and then new parts get gets a form that never would have existed otherwise when you find something like a mushroom that has psilocybin and psilocin and these other compounds within its body um do we do we have any reason to believe that those chemicals exist within the mycelial networks themselves or are they only produced in the mushroom body yeah, totally. Um, 
you know, is not that I was somebody that's a little more focused on just on stream mycology, but I'm pretty sure that's also in the whole mycelial network. And, you know, if I look at just like Paul Stamets um, compounds that he serves, fantastic fun guys, his brand, and he just serves a lot of different nutritional supplements with a lot of different mushrooms. And he includes the mycelium himself in the capsules, including like lion's mane that also stimulates neurogenesis because those same co compounds that are active in the fruit are found throughout the entire system. So I would assume that applies also to psilocybin. I, I definitely join you in being interested in the, in the ecological questions and the question of why these things exist at all. You know, it's, I've heard a lot of people say one of the reasons they have these profound effects on us is because they're so structurally similar to the molecules we already use to make mm -hmm. our experience of reality. So they fit right into the existing slots as if they were human brain chemicals. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes very weird to think that human brain chemicals are laying around in nature <laughs> waiting for mm -hmm. us to do something with them. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, when I thought of that, when I was younger, I had this very fanciful image of, of these substances is like uh, rolls of slow exposure film recording the light patterns of the immediate environment. So there was kind of like a minimal perceiving and remembering of background environmental patterns, which you could then put into your brain and you would observe your normal cognitive experience, but filtered strongly through the background patterns of the biosphere. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm curious where your thinking goes, you know, regardless mm -hmm. of that playful notion about mm -hmm. how we use things to learn about ecosystems, right? Because yeah. it seems like they're a unique, it's a unique way to put the environment inside you, inside mm -hmm. your thinking. That's a little bit different than normal environmentalism. How mm -hmm. do these things mediate our relationship to ecosystems and biospheres? No, I mean, I love the question. And I think that's definitely you know, the type of thinking and context that the entire field of psychedelics become, needs to become more aware of, but then also those of us just are interested in evolution in general. You know, I came across Wilbur's work at 18. I was very fortunate. It was a textbook in a class called God, Mind, and Matter. It's brief history of everything. And it, I was definitely, it's on level of uh, paradigm revelation, you know, this level of just integral thinking of all structures of reality and the philosophy he put forward. And I would say almost the ma next major paradigm shift in many ways was coming across Terrence McKenna's work and taking it very seriously. I read Food of the Gods at 19, but it was really coming back around in my 30s and having this huge background in the ways, you know, understanding of different fields of just of science and philosophy, and then coming and seeing what he was bringing. And that was very psychedelically inspired because I thought he was quite the intellectual and seeing how the whole the entire ecosystem evolved and I still feeling like our culture in the large ways is not aware of that. Um, and so it, it, again, it kind of really kind of in a very holographic way is an expression of this deep oneness that we all have. And as you mentioned, you know, it's we're almost have these exogenous in terms of in, in, instead of indigenous, uh, like internal um, molecules and, and brain neurotransmitters, but they're happening in the environment, you know, just as they happen within our body to relate information to different parts of the body. So it just hormones happen. That's also happening on a larger level. We're parts within this larger whole that's always chemically talking to each other. You know, every kind of internal you know, nutrient that we get sends signals into the body, you know, and that includes, you know, different psychoactive compounds. And it's, it's hard to know how many psychoactive compounds even exist because there's, there's this quite so large, you know, I think there's over 2000 plants have DMT in it. So there's over 200 different species of psilocybin mushroom found in every continent, but Antarctica, right? So these are planted full that exist in pretty much every ecosystem, uh, except something like Antarctica. And so why does the environment produce something that really changes our consciousness in a very deep and varied way? And I think the grounding really comes, as I mentioned with, uh, Richard Doyle's work, Darwin's pharmacy, that they kind of create, you know, these ecological seeds of consciousness. But what we can say then is this kind of becoming systemically aware that these are self-organizing compounds that self-organize us, but also self-organize the environment. The same way our body's trying to create a state of homeostasis inside through the chemical interactions, the environment's trying to do that also. So there's a lot of uh, reason why the, something like psilocybin uh, or the mycelial network itself that can theoretically live forever. You know, there's the largest, longest living organism we know of is a uh, mycelial networks in Oregon, stretching you know, a few thousand uh, acres. They can live forever if the host environment is healthy. So it has a lot of impetus to why to create and stimulate um, organisms that would be happy and non-destructive.
And I think in many ways, you know, it's, I think it's a big statement, but true that we're really off balance as a species because we've lost contact with these compounds that naturally grow across all ecosystems that create a state of general harmony and empathy in a state of oneness and almost this intuitive uh, notion of how to create balance within ourselves and relationship to the rest of the environment. Yeah. There's something, I don't quite have a question here, but I have mm -hmm. a curiosity around the threshold of consciousness because a lot of this is about you know, it's psychoactive. It affects our consciousness. At the same time, there's a huge amount of interest now in, in microdosing and the kind of, you know, effects on your body and your nervous system and your sensory acuity and maybe neurogenesis, neurogenesis things like that, uh, that occur at a level below conscious awareness. All right. Um, so how do we think about that? How do we think about non-conscious psychoactive substances They're like yeah. how do you how do we situate that threshold what's the difference between a conscious and a non-conscious experience of yeah. these substances yeah i think it's, it's a, i'm glad we're coming more awareness to the ways we can have a relationship including with smaller doses that we can kind of integrate into our lives there was uh, several years ago i took a uh, two hits of lsd and went out on a hike and it was one of those important experiences in my life how even even though like a the degrees of difference with dosage, even though they can vary, the experiences can be powerful. There's been many times I've taken five to seven hits of LSD, and yet this two hits of LSD in nature was much stronger than all of those. Um, there's a kind of complete disillusion, again, with one with the environment and so on, and in this larger central consciousness within that ecosystem. And one of the, say, downloads, because I felt like that at the time, but kind of this like, inspired thought that arose but the, is that these are Gaian molecules. These are molecules that help us become aware of the planet and kind of see it almost as a larger whole and entity that we're a part of that is very much intelligent. And that our ancestors' relationships to them would have been very differently, especially, you know, pre-civilized, more tribal um, cultures where many times they would have just ate a mushroom as they found it, right? And so you're walking down and you find a mushroom at any size you're not necessarily always just taking a whole bunch and harvesting them and drying them and waiting for some ritual. You know, you're just going to eat it as you find it, just the same way many animals would. You're not sitting there cognitively like, hey, let's go do a big journey. You're like, oh, why not? Here's a mushroom, eat it. And so it might have been a larger part of their daily diet in small amounts um, than we do now. We didn't have, they didn't have all the stigma, all, all the projection on it. It would have been like, you know, especially with smaller doses, you know, as uh, we found out um, with some clinical studies in the 70s, it increases visual acuity, you know, depth perception. So your perception, your visual perception becomes even more enhanced, which has a lot of different survival advantages. What I hear from most people, including myself, all senses become enhanced, sight, smell, taste, and touch enhanced, right? So a lot of ways that we become in more greater contact with the environment. Um, as McKenna points out, and I see it true with a lot of people, it's also stimulates sexual arousal. Right. So there would have been, again, help our species to create more population and, and kind of expand in size and so on. And as people see with microdosing, let's go of depression, encourages confidence and patience, ease and so on. So even small amounts would have had a huge impact on our tribal setting. And they probably happen a lot more often. You know, for us, it's a new trend. But really what we're just saying is like we're taking small amounts, which is kind of the way they kind of naturally grow in the environment. The question of depression and trauma with these substances is getting a lot of attention. Um, I'm curious how you think that mechanism works. Is it a side effect of the mm. general self or reorganization of a person who gets to experience more of themselves in the world? Is it a side effect of being able to go into flow states more readily? Or mm -hmm. is there some other mechanism by which these things, because psilocybin in particular has been shown to have a strong effect on unlocking trauma patterns and depression modes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't even transmute and, and convey what I've seen and, and the impact it has in my own life. I've seen people as they move and heal and, you know, in their life, it's again, it's, it's, it's life changing. You know, it's very often in these roles that you're like, this is the most important day of their lives. And they know that too, as it's happening um, because sometimes decades of pain can wash away. I'd say half the time, you know, people have a life changing paradigm shift experience with the right set in setting, including those uh, with this uh, studies show 80% with treatment res resistant depression improved. These are people that have gone through years in therapy, tried all the medication. In my experience, I'd say 90% of people improve, you know, in, in general. And there's a very small percentage of people that really don't have too much of an effect. It's more neutral and maybe one or 2% of the population that has almost no effect for it. 
you know, that, that being the case, but for to have a life changing that drastic at a core level experience, even half the time is better than any kind of bridal therapy I've come across. And so, as I've said before, I think what happens at the, at the best kind of explanation is this experience of more interconnection and oneness that really meets all the psychological needs that we have. Most of the people I've worked with come from depression. Uh, it's a, definitely a growing ep epidemic. And at the core of what I see depression is, is uh, having a poor self image and, uh, you know, not a good experience or relationship with self, you know? So if I don't like myself and that's what depression pretty much is, um, life is very painful because you're forced to be a being an entity that you don't want to be. And that's inherently a very painful experience. And so it's filled with a lot of shame. And so it's like be, having this inner child part of you just being beaten saying you're not good enough inside. And it's very, you know, you know all the way to like, I want to exit this world in suicide. As opposed to if you want to contrast it with somebody that really likes themselves, and then they inherently have pleasure in being who they are. So existence is inherently pleasurable. So, so much of it is just a self-esteem issue. And many times, you know, as, as we've seen, these psychedelics are deconditioning agents, like deconditioning our own thoughts, our cultural, you know, impressions of who we've integrated, of who we are as an identity. You know, so the core is this identity shift of who I am. And, and we see that you know, also with Wilbur's words to bring to integral, you know, that the main, you know, growth in, in, in personal and psychological development is the sense of identity from egocentric to ethnocentric to world centric, you know, to all the to, to cosmocentric. And so people are able to follow that pattern. And as we're in pain, understandably like depression, it's like somebody's pinching you, all you can do is focus on that pain. And so you become very self-absorbed. Um, you know, if you have anxiety or depression, and that's correlated in uh, what we know in neuroscience is the default mode network. So when you think me, 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 I, I, it's a specific network in the brain. And we have found that psychedelics like psilocybin um, dissolve the default mode network. That's the network in the brain that's almost acts as a repressive function for the rest of us, the rest of the parts of your brain. And as that dissolves, the whole brain hyperconnects, and which I think is um, correlated with these experiences of unity. So now that I see, instead of being this small disconnected self, I see the wholeness of who I am. You know, I would say all the way is like even an eternal spirit that's always existed and it's interconnected with everything. And that's a possibility. Not everybody gets there. But what can wash away is the deconditioning and that like discovering I am worthy of love. And I think at a core place that I am love and so is everything else. And so we've been in this very unfortunate, painful illusion that we're separate and we're small and that can drastically go away. So I think that's ultimately at the core of what heals the depression. You mentioned uh, downloading this, uh, the meme of guy and molecules. Yeah. It made me think of uh, legendary sci-fi author, Philip K. Dick, who had this famous religious experience and wrote a number of books trying to reinterpret it in various different ways, right? Was this God? Was this aliens? Was it meaningless? Was it an artificial intelligence from another dimension? He just kept trying out interpretations, which is really uh, admirable. And I guess I'm curious, how important do you think it is to be capable of, of taking seriously alternative explanations for our most profound experiences? Mm -hmm. Because often when people have a really profound experience, they don't want to challenge themselves with other interpretations out of a fear they might lose the potency and slide back into some kind of relativism. And how do you handle that? How do you handle really valuing an experience, a download, a revelation, but at the same time needing to challenge yourself to think about other possible meanings it might have? Yeah, no, I love that. And it's going to be say a struggle. Like it will it require some level of tension, right? So, and there's so many factors. And the one I think that is the most important is who are you challenging yourself with? Like, what are the, the, the people that are giving you the feedback? What's their level of awareness? What's their intention? And so on. You know, from grounding my own personal experience, as I mentioned at 18, I had this life changing, till this day, most powerful, you know, psychedelic experience has been more impactful than any experience I've had. And deep unity with God and his voice and I was talking and so on. And so I knew at that moment, this is the most significant thing that happened to me. And I, you know, in a very naive way, you know, talked about it with a few people a couple of days later. And because it was so different, any point of reference of experience they've ever had, you know, and, and they're also interpreting it through their own trauma and worldview. You know, I remember a friend was like, what, you think you're special? And I was like, ouch, you know, like, that's not what I was saying at all. I'm here as a human who had something that was like, oh, my God, this is profound. Like, I, I want to share it the way I would share, you know, something important happened to me in my life. And then also quickly, you know, I was just like, I was, I was aware enough as 18 that, you know, people are going to be like, what, you talk to God on drugs? You know, it, it's so it would really dilute the experience dramatically. And within that week, I, I was aware that, like, I can't talk about this. And I didn't for seven years. 
even though I thought about it every day for seven years. And it was really kind of more moving to the Bay Area and becoming a part of a culture that was more informed, you know, not just psychedelically, but spiritually, um, that I could talk about and meet other people that had similar experiences. And so that now became a container that it was safer to talk about, and now you can receive feedback and so on. So if you're getting challenged from people that really have no understanding of it at all, it can be very painful and it can deal with it, you know, if we're being honest. That being said, you know, there's risks. Uh, one that's important could be like ego inflation, you know, as, as Alan Watts points out, you know, it's a, we're so culturally dependent to the context that we give it. If you have the spiritual experience of like you're one with God, but you all you have is a Christian context, you know, it can be interpreted intellectually as I'm the coming Messiah. I'm Jesus. You know, I was ordained in this very noble way to bring the light because I just experienced this light. Nobody around me has. Well, as opposed to if this happens, say, in the Hindu tradition, you're like, you're so for realized I'm God. Um, people might be like, well, that's awesome. Welcome to the party. I'm glad you found out. You know, so it's, it definitely has to do with the social setting we're a part of. Um, and so I found a lot of my feedback, for better or worse, through books. That's what I had available because I had the mind throughout time available. So I spent a lot of time reading over the next decade, all this, that context. And when I came to the Bay Area, there was so much more community. And now with the internet, there's so much ways. And so if we're in a right, safe, sudden setting that we can be properly understood, I think it's very important to have feedback as a community. Thinking about the different ways these substances have been perceived. And, you know, I, I met, I met Dr. Leary briefly when I was a kid and, you know, very impressive guy, very shiny and lively and smart for an old man. You know, it struck me as being a legitimate elder of some kind, but I, I also thought that his generation, which was just getting used to the idea of computers tended to overthink these things as reprogramming tools. Right. And there were a lot of theories in the 50s and 60s that these were kind of re-imprinting brainwashing compounds to give you a new worldview or a new behavioral expectation, dissolve your old pathways, and that it sort of forced a crisis. There would be a flood of neuropeptides and you would just take a new snapshot of reality. And this could be used by espionage agencies or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is that kind of a model still viable? Uh, do, we, do we think now that the, the reprogramming effects are greater or lesser than what Leary and Conrad Lorenz and the yeah. CIA might have thought was the case. Yeah, I, you know, I love all your questions. You know, I definitely love the, the, the perspective they're coming from. Um, there's a good book called by Markov and Johnson called "Metaphors We Live By." I think it came out in the '70s, and was I think a philosopher, linguist, and the other is a neuroscientist. And um, and then they've released a new book. I think is several a couple decades ago, called something like "The Western Mind," Western Mind and Eastern. Bo it was it had to do with just like embodying philosophy. And really, they really broke down that we primarily learn through metaphors, you know, and metaphor is also going to be kind of different comparing if we're looking at some like spiral dynamics, level of development, where we are in the spectrum of how we're seeing the universe. But, you know, throughout time, for example, you know, in the say time around the Renaissance, the beginning of, of um, the creation of physics, it's like clocks are just coming to place, gears and mechanics. So the universe was seen as a very mechanical way, you know, the kind of more quote unquote, most billion ball kind of cause and effect kind of system. And so the universe, that, that metaphor allowed us to understand things that previously we couldn't. You know, the universe kind of seemed as this unexplainable place that kind of God just does whatever he wants. But now it can be understood because of the metaphor, we can really understand things through the realm of physics. And later, you know, as we kind of advance through computers, that kind of metaphor, you know, is, um, what's it called? Uh, Jeremy Rifkin really points out in Empathic Civilization is an, as new technology comes in, we view everything through that technology. That becomes a main metaphor. So it helps us understand things that we previously couldn't, but every metaphor has its boundaries and limitations, even though it brings a new lens to see things in a new way. And so right now with computers, I think at some level in development and paradigm with consciousness, it, it can bring a lot, you know, like even the whole idea of pre-programming could be something that we wouldn't even have before. You know, but now we can, and that can be helpful to an extent. And we're taking that metaphor all the way to like simulation theory. Is the universe even real? Are we just a simulation? And I think personally, there's a major loss with that. Um, but that's just the technology we have right now. And what I think ultimately is the best metaphor we have, and I really, uh, it, was, it resonates, you know, a lot with the work put forward by Alfred North Whitehead, who was, uh, you know, both, you know, really into, into quantum mechanics and a philosopher that, you know, taught, uh, you know, at, at Cambridge and so on in the beginning of the turn of the last century was the philosophy of organism. That the best metaphor we have is that of an organism. It, they are the most complex you know, structures that we know of in the universe. Like the brain specifically is, is more complex than the sun. 
right? So it, it, we're still learning and understand it correctly. And so if we begin to look at the universe and ourselves as a very, like an, in, as an organism, we can see a lot more deeper and a lot more accurately. And so you don't necessarily reprogram an organism, you know, but it's a very interconnected, highly holistic system. Um, you can create new conditionings and new behavior, um, new levels of input, you know? So I think it's, it's almost like, how do you teach a child to learn? You don't program them. There's something lost in that process, you know, because specifically because the technology, like something like a computer, um, it doesn't have that depth of consciousness, right? It's just a physical thing that you're putting information into. And we are so much more than that. You know, we want to learn. And I think there's like um, a nice distinction there between like information, quote unquote, sometimes there's knowledge and wisdom, where I think is wisdom is like an open heart filled with love that's integrating and embodying the knowledge. Right. And so having an open heart while bringing in the information, I think is going to be a, a greater way to, you know, radically uh, change or transform a system. It's somewhere between the metaphor of the computer and the metaphor of the organism is the metaphor of the network. Yeah. Um, well, what does it mean that digital information tools, brains and mycelium seem so similar to each other? Yeah, no, I definitely, Fritjof Capra points out in the book Systems View of Life, which is like this massive little textbook made for understanding systems theory. And he really breaks down that the prime metaphor for um, all systems thinking is a network. It, it's, it's the prime archetypal pattern. You know, and yet what you have with the network is just a whole bunch of nodes and their relationships. And so relationships become really central. You know, it's very different than just an atomist kind of reductionist view. And what you see with this is that all the nodes co-evolve together. You know, and, and so it's just the uh, same with like the nodes and all, all the neurons in our brain. They're all highly connected and they evolve together. It's not a specific neuron. It's all of them working together. And it's same with us in our relationships and our environments, you know, the planet as a whole is, is that we're just a whole bunch of nodes within nodes, a very like, you know, um, holonic view, you know, that all these holons interconnect at their specific level. And then they create a whole new layer of a network that highly interconnects with other parts. And so... Again, I think what it points to is that it's the relationships in many ways are important because we are constantly evolving each other. That's probably why people are here watching this, you know? So it's, it's definitely- well, we're, right here. <laughs> I was just thinking about how we're like, when you think about mycelium forms by these little, with the hyphae, like come in contact with each other, we're doing that right now. <laughs> That's it, right. bring it to the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the one thing that I, I do like that I think is underneath that old idea about these substances as reprogramming tools is their ability to allow us to adapt to new information and new situations. And because we seem like we're, um, we're at a moment of history where the rate of change is so fast, we can't rely on intergenerational turnover anymore, right? If there was a, mm -hmm. a new shift every thousand years, great, just have kids. But mm -hmm. if there's 10 of those in each generation, there's no way we can catch up or we need something to help us get up to date much faster in terms mm -hmm. of the emergency of future shock. H mm -hmm. How do you think about the role these uh, tools could play in uh, you know, allowing us to realize, to really understand what moment of history we're in as it continues to change. Yeah, no, definitely. I think they are the best tools that we have. You know, I've seen that definitely in my own life. If I didn't have these experiences, which have been the most resourceful experiences that I've had, for example, that from the experience I had that this earth is kind of evolving towards what we would call heaven in the same way an egg corn eventually evolves towards a tree. It's, it's a part of the developmental process, but the whole kind of blueprint of where it's going is already embedded in its very, almost like genetics, but in its code, you know? So there's, um, it's a very really teleological kind of thinking. And for those that aren't aware, it's like telos is an idea all the way from the Greeks that you know, there's many different kinds of cause, including a final cause that we're all being pulled towards something in the future. You know, it's Ray Kurzweil's almost the idea of a singularity that we're being pulled towards another moment because time isn't necessarily that kind of linear and there's something that wants to be birthed and happen. Um, and because I've had those experiences, it, it, it's really kind of made me feel more safe and secure with change and what's happening. You know, as, as people that haven't, you know, we have is the history in this present moment and instead of visions of a possible future, it's easy to become frightened and what I see people entering in psychedelic space, you know, including a lot of clients and including still me, it's, it's, it's very normal that the, the response to uncertainty is anxiety. You know, all anxiety is future based. And so because change is happening and it's because it's new and it's novel, there's a part of most of us uh, that can become anxious, you know, as opposed to excited and embracing. And so as we're 
approaching time that's going to be an accumulation of novelty and change because that's how evolution happens evolution in many ways can be seen as you know the production of novelty of things that have never existed and they arise out of the interconnection of the parts so as the world's becoming more interconnected there's going to be a lot of newness that happens so things that have never existed before are going to come in and that pace can create a lot of crisis you know i believe it's it said that we can without stress handle about 10 percent change at a time you know that's something like moving or having a new job or new relationship and many compounded it can create a lot of stress but now that's happening in a large cultural context so it's going to be scary for people that but that's anchored in the sense of being disconnected of, am i going to stay alive am i going to survive am i going to be enough am i going to be able to tap all these insecurities ultimately uh not feeling this deeper kind of trust and grounding with this process of existence can create a lot of anxiety so for me the only way through and I'm not saying it's easy, right? It's more of a letting go and deep trust, a deeper surrender that this is all good. That this is a part of the process that can be very exciting. And this is the natural pattern of life. Um, something that kind of stood, stood out is as we keep moving forward, and especially around these times, life is going to get weirder and weirder. There's going to be more and more novelty in the rate of novelty. If you can graph it out, change was very, very slow, even from an atomic and to a molecular level of how evolution happened. It was very, very, very slow and slowly begins to accelerate. And we're approaching this place of rapid acceleration. You know, I read a while ago that the pace of knowledge is increasing, like doubling every 18 months, well before it would take generations, right? So there's new information coming in. And how do we and weirdness could be just something unexplained or unnatural or just uh, anomaly or just different than our normal sense of understanding is a weirdness continues to accelerate we see through politics and everything happening in larger levels and increase of technology how do we get to revel in it and enjoy it and enjoy the ride instead of just gripping you know in, in fear how do we keep an open heart in the process yeah that's uh endless and ongoing inquiry yeah there's a word I love from computer science, counter anti-disintermediation, right? It refers to the expectation that people who were building new technologies had that these would liberate people by disintermediating the world, removing the gatekeepers who get intermediated between us. Yeah. But since uh, most of the control and most of the capital comes from establishing uh, tilted relationships, mm -hmm. there was a, a natural and uh, even aggressive and strategic attempt to anti-disintermediate, right? To put themselves back into place so that now the internet, which was supposed to be a, a free space, is controlled by a small number of corporate platforms. So there's a discussion in the tech world around not just how do we create tools that disintermediate reality, but how do we have a strategy for when forces try to undo that and re-co-opt it into extraction and exploitation mechanisms? So mm -hmm. how, how do we think about that in terms of psychedelics? Because I, you know, any mm -hmm. sane spiritual futurist wants these things decriminalized and normalized so they play their natural scientific role in human culture. But what about an immediate future of corporate mm -hmm. control and the logic of capital? Are we on the doorstep of government-sponsored Moderna psilocybin mm -hmm. analogs at $1,000 a pill billed to your insurance provider? Like, how, how do we think about these things getting co-opted and not necessarily mm -hmm. being a liberating force if they fall under the sway of existing power structures? I, I love the question, and I love that you're bringing into the specific realm. And uh, it was, I wrote an entire just chapter on economics and, and psychedelics, specifically blockchain and cryptocurrencies, an entire other kind of chapter on just like technology and, and, and science and psychedelics, because I think it's a very promising intersection that we haven't even looked to enough. And to ground this into some history, there's a book called uh, What the Dormouse Said by John Markoff, where he looks at um, during the 50s and 60s, the, the Bay Area psychedelic culture and how it influenced the technological personal computer revolution. Right. And he's just saying, like, why didn't the computer revolution take place um, largely in the, you know, the East Coast where they allowed like the Ivy League universities and a lot of the money. And it was largely because of the mindsets inspired by psychedelics on the West Coast, you know, that created some like Silicon Valley. And it was very much this kind of liberal kind of mindset of we need more autonomy and freedom as individuals, you know, partly catalyzed by these experiences that kind of decondition us and break us away from cultural conventional norms that we created these technologies. And so, you know. We, there's large levels of just um, in, in, like evidence, you know, for example, Doug Engelbart, who created the, the computer mouse hypertext um, technology and networking in general, 
um, and shown through what's called as like the mother of all demos, I think in 1967 in San Francisco. Uh, he was part of several LSD studies that were taking place in Silicon Valley. There was three LSD research centers happening in the Silicon Valley during the time of the personal revolution. So a lot of this technology that interconnects us now came from that inspired mindset, you know? And I think that will also apply with us moving forward that we'll create new technologies with very similar right intentions and inspired by these states um, that can really bring us uh, a new kind of, um, capacities that prior don't exist. And the one that I've been focused on for the last few years is, is blockchain technology. You know, that caused a deep kind of systemic thinking for me. I was super inspired when I came across it. In 2017, I was, something inside became a little obsessed in a very good way where I was sitting for it on, and understanding its architecture about eight hours a day for four months. And that kind of changed it after that. So four hours a day for the rest of the year, because I was like something so beautiful finally came to existence. Who's very resilient that follows a, a degree of bio, biomimicry that I think is very resonance with these um you know psychedelic states of of oneness and interconnection, and a lot of its processing that it puts forward is this idea of just decentralization. So how do we? take back information and power and distribute it across networks. So it's not held more on single central servers or central nodes. Um, largely also, like you're saying, a lot of the problem is economics because that's how people gain their power. And so at the root of it, the problem I see in society that I kept coming into was how is money created, right? Almost all the issues in the world are economic issues. Like that's why we destroy the environment. This is why we go to war. This is why we have class warfare. You know, it's just, there's a repression, it's oppression of so many different people because somebody's gaining financially. And that's largely based on an uh, you know, uh, economic system. If we look at capitalism, it's focused on very autonomous selves. There's just parts within a network. I want to accumulate more and more for my personal self, you know, at the expense of all the other parts. And that destroys society and, and the environment and so on. And so we need a different value, value system, but also we need a different kind of just structure of, um, of economics. And so right now, economics is debt driven. Money is created out of debt. There's three times more debt in the world than there is money. And that creates an immense amount of stress on all, everybody on the planet, psychologically, and that we end up extracting more from everybody else. And something like blockchain, money is created rhythmically. So right now it's a, a new Bitcoin 6.25 bitcoins created every 10 minutes it's very rhythmically there's nobody in charge of it it's just how it enters the system and the whole code of how it works is open source everybody can see as opposed to right now a central agency that controls how money slash energies enters in and it enters in just to the highest individuals and corporations for debt and then they keep making pro you know money off of it as it keeps moving down this trickle down effect and so they keep right now the economic system where it's wired keeps making a lot of money for the people that are in power and people on the bottom keep losing power. And that would also move all towards technology. So we need a technological system first that can actually scale to the level to restructure itself. And I think blockchain is a very good example of that. When you think as a utopian, when you think if everything went right <laughs> with these substances, what would a civilized approach look like? What, what, is, what is the civilized world of psychedelic integration into society look like in the year 2050? On that other side is, what are the current legal challenges to allowing us to move in that direction? Yeah, totally. I think we're definitely crossing new beautiful threshold, uh, thresholds. And with that, there is uncertainty and people are going to respond in many ways as we don't know what's going to happen as these move towards legalization. You know, it's very inspired to see it taking off on a grassroots level. For example, we decriminalized them here in Oakland. And I was also there at city court, you know, at the hearings and so on and testified. And, you know, a lot of the people that started this movement here didn't know we were going to win, but we saw Denver win. So we tried it here and it's been amazing. We created the here in Oakland, the decriminalized movement that started here, people from, I think, 100 different cities across the U.S. have reached out how to use that template. And now many cities across the U.S. one, you know, we did not see this coming. People just took the initiative, the effort. There's enough education in the culture that people voted for this. And because in the right sudden setting, these compounds are super safe. They're safer than most medications, right? So there's almost, there's like no biotoxicity with psilocybin, right? So, but there, you know, there could be trauma and emotional and psychological problems without the right set and setting. So definitely we need the right containers. That's what we're, we're working on, creating infrastructure where people can have safe experiences. Um, and then we're moving towards federal legalization of MDMA and psilocybin in 2023, next year. So that's around the corner where it's going to move in through the medical model and there'll likely be, you know, psychedelic therapy clinics in every city because it's that effective in, in traditional psychology. And so it's going to move in and there's also going to be, you know, it's, it's taking over the field right now in psychedelics. The main idea is around the ethics of 
specifically boundary crossing, you know, if the boundaries dissolve, um, it's more, there's instances where people can cross sexual boundaries and create more trauma. And that's happened recently as a lot of the uh, um, news articles have been coming out. And so that's something to deeply to look into. But I just finished writing an article on this. It should be coming out this next week on lucid.news around sexual energy coming up in psychedelic psychotherapy. But the problem is much deeper than psychedelics. What I found in the research, about 5% of therapists sleep with their clients, right? So that's major. That's one in every 20. So if you're in a cohort getting trained and there's 20 of you being trained to be therapists, one of you in your career might probably sleep with your client. And so that's already happening in therapy. Um, we haven't been looking at it. And that happens across all of our fields. And priests do it. You know, doctors do it. Gurus have been doing it. Gene shamans have been doing it. You know, sleeping, using these medicines or getting close and intimate to the pyre power structured kind of containers and there's intimacy and vulnerability begins to evolve and those lines can become blurred but with psychedelics sometimes maybe the trauma can be deeper because you're so open and there's a loss maybe of agency in those moments and so we're trying to figure out how to create the ethics around it but i think it's the problem is much deeper than psychedelics as i mentioned it's already something that's been happening in the field that's going to be i think the main difficulty as we move towards legalization and then there's the financial stuff as you had mentioned and as um finances with people, corporations with a lot of money want to get interested because there is a lot of money to be made because it's very healing. Something like psilocybin, you know, it's why I've had to really put forward of why it's the right medicine right now. I think there's historical relevance of how we evolved, but it's also almost very accessible that you can get online and for a hundred bucks takes growing class. You know, a friend teaches class online is mycorrhizaeafungi.com is Seth Warner. He, he teaches a lot of classes on this. And so for a hundred bucks and then the you know, the material itself is maybe 150, you can theoretically grow mushrooms for the rest of your life, right? They grow on every continent, but Antarctica, they're, they're plentiful, right? And so there's no reason to go paying, you know, if pharmacies could, because of how effective they are, they would be charging, you know, hundreds of dollars for a month's supply of microdoses because it's many times more effective than SSRIs. And so we can take the power back because they grow everywhere. You know, they, they can't really patent that compound, but what they can do is, you know, add or change a few different atoms and create a variation of it in the patented. And we have no reason to go with them. An expensive part is just being with trained individuals, you know, so we're releasing right now, like a, with Silo Health, um, another offering where people, it's a four hour training that'll be online probably by May, uh, where people have enough information to sit for one another, you know, instead of going to professionals. So there's right now in the grassroots level, many ways to make this accessible. There's an interesting, subtle tension around, you know, cultivating responsible containers and still enabling human freedom to enter into messy exchanges, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of people who are very pro-psychedelic, but also very, you know, political and professional and cautious and say, look, you got to realize these are dangerous, only use them in a safe setting with a qualified instructor within a wisdom lineage of some kind. And that's mm -hmm. extremely sensible. However, is there something we lose if we don't also have that Gonzo Hunter Thompson free range psychedelic experience where people are taking risks and probing how these substances interact with other dimensions of culture and psychology and personal relationships? I, 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 I mean, the quick answer is yes, I think something is lost. And my idea is more towards kind of liberty in the sense that all drugs should be decriminalized, right? Like there should not be some external force uh, saying what I can and cannot put in my body as long as I'm not hurting somebody else. That is my call. And uh, that's my right on so many ways, specifically how I, you know, change my mind and my heart. And if we don't have the liberty, I'm not sure like what, that's like so foundational in this existence. If we have freedom of speech, it's like what I put out, like I should be able to have freedom of what I put in. And so across the board, we need that fundamental freedom. I think, and along with that, we also need a lot of education. You know, so we can create uh, informed decisions. And I think what's happened is that uh, some of the backlash or shadows, people looking for deep healing because they've been in pain and torment sometimes for decades. They're so desperate to find relief that they go into containers that weren't safe, that they thought were safe. And they're having these traumatic experiences, you know, whether in a ceremonial setting or with other kind of therapists and so on. And so it's people that weren't necessarily looking for freedom and excitement and novelty and, and adventure and time that you, that kind of very open way that ended up getting hurt. That being said, some of my most exciting and transformative experiences have been in something like a um, recreational and festival setting, you know, recreational, but like recreate, it's very full of play and joy and safe and fun. And 
those are amazing experiences for me to have them in, in structured settings. So within a larger container that I create, whether it's like a festival world, this is kind of largely what's happening. There's a lot of people taking these medicines or I me mean, in the forest with some friends or at home or with a, a close partner. And so that freedom is super fundamental. Um, but then I also think we also need to have these highly kind of structured options for people that are looking at it for those specific reasons. Yeah, nicely said. Terrence McKenna gave a great talk to a bunch of UFO enthusiasts called the Inside Outsider. And he said to them something like, like, if you guys really want to be taken seriously, the psychedelic community has something that science purports to need that you don't have, which is repeatability, right? And it's an interesting point. And with the current new level of seriousness around UFO phenomenon, it seems like it's important to figure out whether, say, psilocybin-induced experiences of unusual entities do or do not have anything in common with the kinds of things that uh, sober Navy pilots and radar signals are picking up. How viable a tool do you think psychedelics are in studying other kinds of anomalous phenomenon? I think it's the best tool we have, to be honest. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, if I were to translate that or compare it to something, some level of technology, you know, a level of telescopes or infrared technology that's looking out into space, they're not necessarily picking up a whole lot in terms of like intelligent life out there, right? Um, but people are repeatedly having these experiences of contacting intelligent life, though it's, it's, um, it's really hard to see where they're ontologically situated. Are these in other realms, you know, slash dimensions? Are they here in, in our physical world and so on? But across the board, what I'm seeing, you can see it throughout the literature and just the, the psychedelic, just kind of informational space, that there's regular contact with very specific entities, you know, whether it's like these kind of elvic or just kind of, you know, extraterrestrial or even just deep archetypal entities that kind of keep existing that, that we kind of keep moving into. And I think there's enough of it to have a, a type of consensus of what they are and who they are. I, I believe there's studies going on right now in the UK on um, in a very clinical setting about entities encountered in the DMT space, right? Because they constantly show up when you take DMT. And uh, just to keep pointing out, it's just um, psilocybin has DMT in it. It has DMT, the compound with a few more atoms added to it. And the well, or tryptamines work very similar to parts of the brain. And so, you know, and, and also to take account that these substances have been available throughout human history. You know, it's, it's theorized, as Merlin Sheldrake points out in his book, Entangled Life, that psilocybin is perhaps 65 million years old. Really. So it's been here far beyond us as a species. McKenna says something I think is all worth noting that alien life was going to be more alien than we can ever imagine, right? And so he said, and he posits, he's like, this is a big thing, and, and I hope not to be judged to it, but this is what the mushroom told me. Right. This is in the introduction of the psilocybin growers guy that came out in the 70s and 80s that the mushroom told them that it is an extraterrestrial entity, that it's a very different kind of life form. And just as spores kind of can move and exist throughout space because it's such a kind of hardened internal shell that they can still be alive and move through space, that it came and populated and brought this kind of psilocybin compound through on this planet. And the way it kind of hyper connects our brains, but also kind of in a very tele-empathic way kind of connects us with each other. It's, it's very often that people have these deep archetypal experiences of seeing other cultures on some side. And, you know, whether it's like Aztecs or Asians and you see pyramids and so on, how it could have translated information throughout our species on this planet. And that's why we have a kind of very similar cave paintings throughout the world where it's geometric shapes and a lot of hybrids between humans and animals and also the same kind of pyramid um, kind of structures in terms of uh, our civilized, you know, architectural constructs that happen on this planet, this passage of information. He said that will happen also between our planet and other planets when we're ready, that the psilocybin mushroom will even give us the ability and blueprints how to create spaceships when we're ready. We're just not ready yet, you know? And so there's is a, so in that way, it not only connects our species, but it's going to connect our minds to all the other civilizations in the, in the, in the, um, in the galaxy and so it could be a very direct way you know to connect and contact um other civilizations so it's almost as we're seeing that the physical world is super interconnected from all the way level of, of quantum mechanics with entanglements of ecological way and even our solar system and how it connects with gravity how gravity connects everything together that's also happening through our interiority our insight is also deeply connected, you know, as Jung would say, almost like collective unconscious, except this collective unconscious seems to be very conscious. And not only is there like a whole lot of the, it kind of holds the contents of everything on this planet, there's a larger container that holds everything that's in the universe, you know, and within then it should theoretically just be very possible to connect with other beings. And that seems to happen, what I've seen over and over with a lot of people. 
if someone came to you in a safe legal context uh, and mm-hmm. wanted to have have a religious epiphany, wanted to merge with the interconnectedness of all things, what kinds of instructions would you give them? Yeah, that's a great question. The first and foremost, whether it's self-protection or for theirs, is um, the high possibility that it may not happen. Right? So it's just like we, we, it's, it's grace in many ways that we can do everything right and structure it up to have that you know, mystical experience. And it's not up to us. You know, there's people that come in yearning for that and I'm going to give them 10 grams of mushrooms and they're not going to have it because, I mean, I can theorize why, right? There, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why, why it won't, whether it's their receptor sites are clogged from years of SSRIs because they haven't maybe done enough self-development where their hearts are now open and their mind is not, or maybe they're very controlling people. So there's not a lot of tension in their body. There's, there's a ways where the system isn't open up to surrender to that level of degree. And maybe it's not the best thing for them at that moment. So, you know, it's not necessarily like it's a carnival ride at Disneyland. I should just get in line for and go into. It's just like, is this, are you ready for this? As Groff pointed out, you know, he said there's kind of like a stages moving towards the transpersonal. There's a perinatal just trauma from the birth, and then there's like the, the personal trauma and so on. And these are many times they have to be worked on or worked on enough to move into transpersonal space. Like enough individual work has to be there so we're not held back by the tension of these egoic structures, just a sense of self, not, not judging it, just a sense of self that can dissolve and open and become more transparent to the all. And so again, I just the hardest part of my job has been. Uh, managing expectations and disappointments, you know, and they're not, they're not, they're few and far in between, but it's really hard when somebody's either pay the money and spent months waiting for it. And they're really wanting this life changing experience and they don't get it, you know, it's six hours of them dealing with a disappointment, which they may need, you know, and again, that's few and far in between, but it, it, it's, it's hard and it's sad. It's easier for me to work with deep trauma than somebody's like, I'm not getting what I'm wanting. And, you know, they're like, but I did all the things and why they, they create a story. Like, why didn't I get saved? You know, it's just like, I don't know. Keep showing up, you know, as McKenna says, it's an art form. It doesn't work the first time. Go again. That being said, the advice I would give is start living as if almost you already had those insights. So be in deep integrity, deep, open heart, open, you know, be in love. That's kind of is the guiding force in many ways. Um, do some research, you know, become create context around the experience already of like, if you had it, um, live a good life. And I mean that not just for yourself, but for everybody, you know, it, what we have seen with people in the tr- self-transcendence state of development with Maslow, it's just like past self-realization is like they're, living for more than themselves. They're, they have a larger sense of meaning and purpose. You know, they're driven by a mission of, I want to be of service and help. And that's a very wide open heart of approach. So the more, it's hard to say this, but the more people are sensitive and open hearted and just, you would say good people. And it's not to say that there's bad people and just are judging good and bad, but that they're already living this very heartful way. They seem to be more available to these experiences. I guess we're just about done. I'm curious whether there's anything like uh, what's been on your mind lately in this area that's exciting or intriguing that I haven't asked you about. No, a great question. You know, like the book comes out, it's been maybe five years of focused organization work and writing, but it's, it feels like a 20 in the sense of like, I wanted to do this since I was a teenager. So I put everything I could, I've read every published book pretty much on mushrooms that I could come across for it. And 75 books just on psychedelics. There's just, four or 500 re- like reference other books in that it was just a tremendous amount of work uh, and i hope you know it, people are able to know that it exists so they're able to look at it at least but i think it's definitely a deeply worthwhile read um so that's new for me and then in the same way that this field is coming in and it hasn't existed to this level or degree before there's going to be job some people are interested to work on it the job opportunities and roles that don't even exist yet you know we each have our place and that for people, whether it's psychology, whether it's law, whether it's, you know, artists, whether it's people developing writing and theories, you know, like there's so much place to create this. I, I don't think there's more of a, a powerful way of transforming and it's what our world needs the most, you know, and, and even if people are into like technology, I mean, you can use it to inspire you to create ideas to make it in. Um, and there's going to be shadow sides in the sense of, you know, like what's what happening with sexuality and then money and so on. And I think we're completely capable of addressing the shadow issues. They shouldn't be, you know, we shouldn't just stop because there's going to be shadows. There's going to, you know, as a uh, Wilbur and Sarah Damics point out, every time we move towards a new paradigm, there's definitely this crisis shift. You know, we're leaving one paradigm with the other that's a radical lot of change. And the new paradigm addresses a lot of the shadow of the prior paradigm. That's why we evolved and took it. But that paradigm is also going to have shadow. 
And a part of the process is confronting and integrating that shadow and becoming more whole. So, um, you know, so I'm just going to say like, we're completely capable of confronting everything that comes up and to just engender more trust within ourselves as individuals and our species and our planet as a whole as we move forward. It's very exciting that we, we don't know the shadow and we don't know what the jobs are yet, but we can see it emerging. Uh, this has been great, Jahan. I, I love your, I mean, you bring a lot of clarity and subtlety and passion to this. Uh, and the book is very literate, very well informed, very personal, a lot of fun and extremely inspiring. So thanks very much for the chat and thanks for thank your you. lifetime of work so far. Thank you. It's a joy talking. You're quite a wordsmith, you know, quite a deep thinker. So it's a, it's a, a very honor to be probed, you know, with, with your mind. Thanks.